Hi everybody! Hello from NASA Earth. My name is Katie and I am here live to talk with two of our awesome scientists about permafrost. They're getting ready to join. So in the meantime, we will be taking some audience questions. If you want to know more about permafrost, like what it is, which we'll get to in a second, please feel free to drop that in the chat. In the meantime, we're waiting for Dr. Chip Miller and Dr. Kimberly, si Kimberly Miner, both NASA scientists at NASA JPL studying Earth, to join us. They should be with us any moment. Um, but like I said, right now, get ready, get excited, start thinking about what permafrost might be, and start sending us your questions in the chat. We're really looking forward to it. Like I said, my name is Katie, and I work in social media at NASA's Earth Science Division. So I'm here to talk to Dr. Um, Chip Miller, Dr. Kimberly Miner, about what we're going to be learning. Um, I'm really excited, and I think we have some really interesting stuff that we don't talk about very much. Let's see if they have sent us a join request. They'll be joining us from NASA Climate Change, which is our climate-focused Instagram. Permafrost sounds cold. I see that in the chat. Yes, it is cold. We'll get more into how cold and the importance of that uh, cold very soon. All right, we'll keep hanging out. I don't see their invite quite yet. Let's see. And there they are right now. Hey, everybody. Hey, good Hello, you're here. Fantastic. Hi, Kimberly. Hi, Chip. How's it going? Good. How are you doing, Katie? Thanks for having us today. Good. I'm glad to have you. I am jealous that y'all are sitting outside. I think the weather in California is a little better than where I am right now. Yeah, we're at beautiful JPL today. <laughs> uh, future's so bright, Kimberly has to wear shades. Oh, I forgot I was wearing shades. I should take those off. That's Bye, all right. Just bragging about the weather. So we're going to get started. Um, let's start with permafrost. Like, what is it? Where is it? What are we talking about when we say permafrost? Okay. So uh, permafrost is soil that is predominantly found in the far north and uh, in the Arctic or in the boreal forest. Um, and what the technical definition of permafrost is soil that has been frozen continuously year round for at least two years. But a lot of the permafrost that we're talking about today has been frozen for hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of years. So this is some old stuff. And you mentioned in the far, far north, I imagine you're talking places like Greenland where there are ice sheets covering the ground, but is it other places as well? Yeah, for sure. So you just think about the Arctic. So you've got Siberia up there, Alaska, which is part of the U.S. Um, the Canada, Canada has some Arctic, Greenland. There's a lot of ground covered here. It's actually about a quarter of the land mass is covered in permafrost right now. Wow, that's a lot more than I realized. And I saw someone mention it's under tundra, right? It's under tundra. It's under other ecosystems as well. Yeah, it's under tundra. Um, like Chip mentioned, it's under forests, it's under glaciers. So it's just soil that's going to be frozen, like Chip said, for more than two years, which means that you can really find it in a diversity of places that maintain cold temperatures. Right. And the thing that um, we've been thinking a lot about, and I'll show the, the paper that we had in Nature Climate Change, that talks about the possible emergence of biogeochemical uh, risks and hazards from the thawing permafrost. So because of climate change, there's been a rapid and massive widespread loss of permafrost coverage in the Arctic. And that's one of the things that led us to think about what might be coming out of this deep freeze. So you're talking about why we study permafrost and, and we do clearly, you both do, but what does it look like when we study permafrost? So um, we've got a couple different angles that we're taking on studying permafrost, right? So. A lot of what we talk about in the broader community is greenhouse gases emerging from the permafrost. And one of the ways that that happens is there are microbes that have been um, entrained in the permafrost, extremophile microbes, meaning they can withstand really crazy temperatures and pressures. And they may have been in the permafrost for up to a million years. And as it starts to warm up and the permafrost starts to turn from, you know, the solid ice into more of like a muddy substance, they have the opportunity to eat all the carbon, like think dead things, that is stuck in the permafrost with them. And then basically they're farting out methane and CO2. It goes into the atmosphere and it 
increases the, the global warming cycle, the, the global carbon feedback loop. Yeah, so Kimberly was talking about uh, the farts. Permafrost that has thawed smells really bad, Katie. It's like a sewer. And it's black and sludgy and uh, doesn't look very appealing either. Yeah, it's awful. It's really gross. It's worse than you could imagine. I never, I never thought anyone was telling the truth. And then you go to it, the permafrost tunnels and you're like, oh my God. Really? So you know what permafrost smells like? That makes me think you've probably had some experience up close with permafrost. Are you studying, studying permafrost on the ground? How are you learning more about it? Well, we just got back um, from a field trip in Alaska going and looking at the permafrost tunnels. We have a bunch of different kinds of ways to look at permafrost um, in situ or boots on the ground. We have a number of different satellite programs that look at um, different dynamics, including the Arctic and including permafrost. And then CHIP actually runs um, a flight program. Yeah, so there's a, a NASA project called the Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment, which is abbreviated above. And we have uh, flown for several years now airborne sensors that are the precursors or the predecessors to satellite sensors looking at the permafrost and correlating the measurements we make from airplanes with the measurements that we make from the boots on the ground so we can get ground truth for those. And this is setting us up for some satellites which will be launched as part of NASA's new Earth System Observatory. And uh, one of those will be the, the NASA Indian Space Agency Synthetic Aperture Radar, or NISAR. And we can use radar to look down and see where things are thawed or where it's still frozen. And the radar is really good at differentiating thawed water or liquid water from frozen ice. And the permafrost, when it's frozen, is, is more solid than concrete and you can't penetrate through it at all. And so the radar is really sensitive to that. Another sensor that we'll be developing as part of the Earth System Observatory is called the Surface Biology and Geology Sensor. Um, Kimberly and I are both working on that mission. And that will be hyperspectral imaging. So imagine all the colors of the rainbow and then expanding on to include the near infrared and the short wave infrared and being able to look at all of those simultaneously coming back from the from the tundra and from the boreal forest. And that allows us to characterize the vegetation like the trees, the shrubs, the uh, sedges and the lichens, or even the bare ground that's covering the permafrost areas and understand what the correlations are between the landscape and the permafrost that underlies it. So it's kind of like building a tower. We start from the ground, setting it on the ground, and then we reach airplane level and we're gonna reach satellite level. Now, I know you all have some really recent research that came out about permafrost. Can you talk a little bit about what you learned and published in this paper? Yeah, so the paper that we put out in Nature Climate Change recently, um, we were able to get some really good coverage on it. We had over 10 countries writing articles about it. And basically, we were looking at all the microbes that we were talking about that are up to a million years old. And if they were to come out and rejoin us in the modern ecosystem, what that would look like and if there were any potential you know risks that we could easily identify because there's a lot more research to be done and then if you think about so that started up to a million years ago into you know more modern times and then back starting with the romans and then up through our modern industrial period humans have been interacting with the arctic um, in a variety of ways either through atmospheric deposition of things like mercury and lead or direct deposition where we put barrels of nuclear waste in the frozen Arctic and leave them there. So we um, looked at organic chlorine chemicals, so pesticides basically, uh, nuclear waste, oil, and different metals that are all in the Arctic in some form or another, whether intentionally or unintentionally stored there. And what's gonna happen when the permafrost thaws and the glaciers melt and these all start moving into the bigger ecosystem. So how does this stuff end up there? You know, some of it you mentioned is intentionally stored, but some of it seems like it started at, you know, lo lower latitudes closer to where you or I live. So if you think about the world as like a closed system, right? Everything moves somewhere. So if we are even in the mid latitudes, you know, where you or I live, Katie, releasing things into the atmosphere, they have the potential to move to the north and to the south where they can get stuck because of the cold temperatures and snow. And then they move down and then they get stuck again in glaciers or in the permafrost and they would stay there except for the fact that we are now warming the planet. 
So basically all of these things that we thought were going to stay in the Arctic now have the potential to be moving out of the Arctic and maybe all at the same time. Right. And the way that they get into the atmosphere in the first place is by burning things typically like coal or wood, which have some of these metals in them. Um, we burn them, they get up into the atmosphere, they float all around the world. And when they're deposited in the Arctic, they basically freeze in place. Um, with some of the pesticides and other chemicals, they can make it either into the waterways or because they're volatile, um, you can smell them, right? They, they are vapors in the atmosphere. They also get transported into the Arctic where it's cold enough that when they actually hit one of the surfaces, they freeze in place. So we've accidentally put a lot of stuff in our freezer and now we've unplugged the freezer a little bit. Yeah, accidentally and on purpose, right? We've put a lot of nuclear materials, nuclear waste up there and intentionally left it there and then forgot that the freezer was going to warm up. <laughs> so we're going to take some questions from the audience. There's been a lot of questions come in because I think this is a really interesting and, you know, we don't talk about permafrost that much. Uh, first up, what are the potential costs to like infrastructure from permafrost thaw? Is the, it, you know, there are roads up in the northern latitudes. Are there, are there risks to infrastructure? Yeah, so Kimberly, you were driving while we were in Fairbanks. Do you want to tell them what the roads are like? Yeah, so the, the <laughs> roads are more bumpy for sure right now. And they have the potential to be even more bumpy or lose their structure completely as the permafrost below them thaws. We also have this dynamic that we notice called drunken trees or drunken telephone poles, where, you know, you think about this concrete that you've got the trees and the poles stuck in. If it's not actually concrete anymore, it's turning more to mud. They start to kind of lean off to the side. And so every year the telephone poles and the, the wires and the trees get a little bit lower to the ground. And then anything that we pave over, right? So um, roads, uh, airplane, uh, runways, all of those have the potential if they're on permafrost to lose their stability, which could impact infrastructure. Right, the, when, the, when the permafrost freezes and thaws, it tends to make almost like a mini roller coaster. And so the roads buckle up and down and up and down and uh, need to be rebuilt quite frequently. And then you might have seen pictures or heard about some of the coastal villages which have been built on permafrost and there for hundreds if not thousands of years they're starting to erode and fall into the sea or into the lakes because the thermal erosion from the water is thawing the permafrost underneath them they no longer have this really firm understructure and their foundations are literally falling out from underneath them wow that is some significant damage i would say so another question, and maybe this one is a little more fun, maybe. Um, is this an opportunity to discover like new bacteria or fungi that we've never seen before? So when we started researching this, I actually reached out to a number of biotech firms in Silicon Valley um, to discuss this question. And I think that the general consensus is yes, it will be very difficult, but especially when we're talking about different adaptations, you know, how did these microbes last so long? What are they bringing with them from the past that maybe we don't know about or our microbes don't show in the same way? I think there is potential to scavenge some of these characteristics and traits as the microbes emerge. So we have the potential to have some great breakthroughs from these microbes. There's also, you know, potentially negative side, but we don't know how they're going to interact with the modern ecology. So both um, opportunities and challenges, I think, are very much presenting themselves with the permafrost thaw. Two other things you might think about, Katie. Um, one is that modern humans, uh, us, Homo sapiens, are only about 100,000 years old. And yet some of these microbes that have been unearthed from the permafrost have survived for more than a million years. And so they are much, much older than we are and we haven't been exposed to them. So who knows what might happen when we interact with them. The other thing is that because we work for NASA, we think about what life might be like on other worlds and what other worlds are like. And the Arctic is a very cold and more, more or less dry place. So cold and arid, very much like Mars. And so the Arctic is a great analog or model for what we might expect to find on a place like Mars where we would be looking for extraterrestrial life. 
And if it were microbial and surviving for a long, long time without a lot of water around, it might look a lot like the microbes that you find in the Arctic. So one of the things that we're doing is exploring with tools that we would be using on Mars to see what the spectra and the measurements look like um, in situ in the permafrost tunnel so that we can give information to the people looking on Mars. You might want to look for something that looks like this. So yeah, so well, we're looking at using the Mars rover tools in the permafrost and seeing if we can use the information together to understand if we're actually finding life on other planets and what it would look like. That's NASA teamwork. And I feel like now I've, I've never been to Mars, but I've been to Alaska. So that's basically the same as how I'm, I'm hearing this, right? Um, yeah. In fact, Katie, you and I have flown together on research <laughs> flights in, in Alaska and done these types of events from there, right? So we're practically wonder, Martian astronauts. I wonder if the Alaskans <laughs> might take issue with that characterization. <laughs> we'll have to see yeah. if it pops up in the chat. <laughs> um, so we'll take one more question from the audience before we go. So some people are asking, how soon might some of these frozen biological, chemical, radioactive materials start reemerging from the permafrost? So uh, this spring, we've got a big push, Chip and I do, to model uh, and understand what's going on. Based on what we found in the most recent paper, I think we're looking at some very emergent dynamics in a certain number of areas. So in the Kara and Barents Sea in Siberia, we're already seeing um, a need for remediation from nuclear um, submarines and vessels that have been left there. Um, there's already oil and mercury moving through the tundra. And then we already are finding and identifying microbes that are these ancient Methuselah or extremophile mi microbes. And we're starting to build an index of what they look like. So we're gonna help participate in that effort coming in the spring. So we've got a number of different ways that we're trying to answer this question just as fast as we can. So that if we do have these abrupt thaw events where we have a lot of thaw over a short period, we kind of know what's coming and they are going to be able to alert folks who are in the local area. Yeah. And you're, you know, the, the questions you're getting from the audience, Katie, are spot on because the scientists in what we call state of the art thinking are asking exactly these same questions. When might the permafrost thaw? Where might it thaw? How fast might it thaw? And we have very little information on which to base our modeling and our projections into the future. And so we're asking exactly the same questions. And we would like to couple this with models of how the water flows might change or how things might be released. And we also don't really have good surveys on what the distribution or population is of these microbes and of the various metals and um, pollutants that have made it into the permafrost where they are. And so coupling all of this together, we would like to be able to provide a much better projection to people so that we can help understand where there might be human interactions with these potential risks. So it's a really complex topic and a really complex system. And we're just trying, as a whole community working in the Arctic, we're trying to really chip away at these questions as, as fast as we can. Well, that sounds fantastic. It sounds like you've got some upcoming research. I think we can drop in the uh, comments when we're done with this live, maybe some links to some of your your upcoming work and the paper that you just put out. But it's been yeah. great chatting with you both. Chip, Kimberly, thank you Thanks, so much. Katie. Thank you so much for having Let us Let me just today. say, Kimberly has a great social media profile, so please follow her. You can find out lots of information there. All right, and Bye. we'll be updating on our NASA Earth and NASA Climate channels as well. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Katie.